Chapter twenty six of the Life and Adventures of Michael Armstrong, the Factory Boy. This is a LibriVox recording. Chapter twenty six A Dismal Enterprise and Its Melancholy Result. Martha Dowling Punished More Severely Than She Deserved. Very Wild Projects Conceived by Miss Brotherton and Speedily Put in Execution. It is now necessary that the narrative should briefly return to the period of Miss Brotherton's arrival at Milford Park after her unsuccessful expedition in pursuit of Michael. There was no needless delay between this return to her home and the communication to Mrs. Armstrong and Edward of the dismal news of which she was the bearer, nor was there any consultation on this occasion concerning the mode of her reaching Oxley Lane. Poor Mary had greatly advanced in independence of spirit within the last few months and had she encountered all the military quartered within twenty miles with the dowling family marching in procession at their head she would have quietly driven through them all with their carriage windows up perhaps but with no greater precaution except indeed an order to the coachman to drive on without stopping let them meet who they would the carriage was at the door the morning after their return and miss brotherton had not yet named her intended expedition to mrs tremlett you are going out without me my dear said the old lady on hearing it announced i am going to the widow armstrong's dear nurse replied the heiress your presence cannot help me through this dreaded visit then why should i make you share the pain of it why my dear because i am of no earthly use and had better die at once if i cannot be of some little comfort to you at such a time as this why don't i know all about it and how you must feel at this very moment just as well as you do yourself mary sure it was a foolish notion to leave me here enjoying the armchair and the footstool and the flowers while you are having your heart broken by telling that poor pale body that the child she loved so dearly is dead and gone for ever if you could save either her or me a pang nurse tremlett i would not thus have spared you replied miss brotherton however you shall go with me dear friend it is quite like yourself to wish it and in truth i might have guessed that you could not have remained easy and quiet at home while i was so engaged and poor fanny i have left her very busy with martin assisting in arranging the little room i have assigned her near my own shall we tell her where we are going in case she should come in here to look for us my dear mary if you will take my advice you will let her go too if you do not the whole of this terrible talk will have to begin all over again for of course when mrs armstrong hears that you have got with you the only person who can tell anything about her boy she will be restless and anxious to see her and then won't it be all over again mary it will indeed dear nurse you are very right and very wise in this she shall go with us poor child though it will be a dreadful task for her replied mary and you would rather take it dear all on your own shoulders i do not doubt that only you don't know how to manage it replied mrs tremlett but there is another thing mary that i have been thinking of continued the kind-hearted old woman and that is the other poor boy i'll engage to say he has never missed school for an hour after what you said to him about exerting himself i saw how he took it and therefore you may depend upon it that he is at the schoolhouse now then just think my dear what his going home will be after you have told all poor creatures it makes one's heart sick to fancy it if i were you mary i would send for him tell him everything at once and then take him home to his mother miss brotherton instantly rose and rang the bell do not say you are of no use my dear good creature said she how infinitely better this will be than the hurried thoughtless plan which i had sketched a message was accordingly despatched to the schoolhouse to summon edward armstrong and in a few minutes he stood before them most true is it that there is something holy and imposing in the presence of sorrow it would be difficult to imagine any entree into the boudoir of miss brotherton which would have inspired a feeling both in her and her friend so nearly approaching awe as did that of edward armstrong there is no need to tell him poor fellow exclaimed mrs tremlett mournfully shaking her head as she saw the sudden and eloquent change in edward's countenance the moment he looked in the face of miss brotherton there is no need to tell him he knows it all already he is dead then said the boy his pale lips parting as it seemed with difficulty to pronounce the words please ma'am let me go away he looked as if he were unable to sustain himself and mary really fearing he might fall started from her seat and throwing her arms round him almost carried him to the sofa 
no no my poor edward she said do not go away stay with those who love and pity you poor michael is dead edward and we must all try to support your mother under the dreadful news how do you know he is dead cried edward starting up and looking almost sternly at his benefactress how do you know that they have not hid him away where you cannot find him that they may torture him and work him to the bone when there is nobody by to see i know that he is dead but too well edward replied mary gently i have brought home with me a little girl who worked in the same factory and who knew him well he died of an infectious fever that killed many many more i am going to take this little girl with me to your mother edward that she may question her if she wishes it about poor michael and i wish you to go with us my dear boy it is better that your poor mother should have you with her you are going to tell mother said the boy with a shudder yes edward it must be done and the sooner it is over the better your mother is a good woman and a pious christian my dear boy she will know and feel that all that can befall her is the will of god and when she remembers this she will rise above her sorrow and think of the better world hereafter will be able to say his will be done yes ma'am if it does not kill her first answered edward indeed i think a great deal will depend on you dear edward as to her manner of bearing it if she sees you sink be sure she will sink too but if you make her feel that she still has a beloved child to live for to whom life may yet be a blessing she will cease to repine for the loss of one child for the sake of making the other happy edward slowly and silently shook his head but after the melancholy silence of a minute or two he said i will do my best ma'am the scene which followed beside the bed of the poor widow was one of such deep but patient sorrow as left an impression never to be forgotten on the minds of those who witnessed it mary's counsel had not been thrown away upon edward the boy displayed both a delicacy and firmness of character beyond his years and above his education no ordinary topics of consolation were clumsily uttered to redeem his pledge to mary nor did he affect a stoical indifference which he could not feel but with gentle endearments he drew the mourning mother to think of him and there was healing as well as agony in the tears she shed upon his bosom of all this fanny was a silent but deeply moved spectator the widow gave her one earnest look when mary said this little girl was the last person who spoke to michael before he was laid on the sick-bed from whence he never rose and she seems to have loved him dearly one long earnest look was turned upon her when this was said but no word was spoken to her for the time was not yet come when the bereaved mother could seek comfort in anything nevertheless when miss brotherton rose to go and pressing the hand of the poor sufferer in her own promised to pay her another visit soon mrs armstrong murmured in her ear i should like to see that little girl again when i can bear to name him mary nodded her assent and left the mother and son to exchange thoughts and feelings which when deep and genuine must ever be held sacred from every unkindred eye most watchfully did mary attend to this poor pensioner and many were the hours during which she sat reading the book of life beside her bed by degrees too the bereaved mother did bear to name her lost darling to fanny fletcher and having once listened to the sweet tones of her gentle voice as she related all she had heard him say all he had seemed to feel and all he had seemed to think the poor woman grew so enamoured of the uneventful tale that she wearied not of making her repeat it for days together fanny would beg to be left beside her while edward resumed his place in the school and miss brotherton often thought when she drove to hoxley lane in the evening to bring back her little protege that she had never chanced to witness so pretty a specimen of female tenderness and pity as this lovely little girl exhibited while ministering to the poor crippled woman whose only claim upon her love was that she wanted it a species of claim by the way that is very rarely made in vain upon any uncorrupted female heart with every want prevented soothed by the most generous kindness attended with the most watchful love and cheered by a greater appearance of reviving health in the boy that she had thought crippled for life than she had ever ventured to hope for it might have been expected that the widow armstrong would in some degree have forgotten past sufferings and have once more looked forward with hope but no it could not be this last this heaviest of all her sorrows came too late to be wrestled with as others had been and though her meek nature seemed so peacefully resigned that there was more pleasure than pain in watching over her 
she was in truth dying of a worn-out spirit and a broken heart by some means or other the news that little michael armstrong was dead reached dowling lodge sir matthew knit his brows wondered how the devil anybody could have got tidings of him but said nothing to all the rest of the family save one the intelligence was too unimportant to be listened to at all but to that one to the already conscience-stricken and repentant martha it was a heavy blow most miserable indeed had been her state of mind for the last few months from the day of her painful but useless visit to miss brotherton her eyes had been in a great degree opened to the hard and avaricious nature of her father's character like a person excluded from the light of the sun and seeing only by the delusive glare of an unsteady lamp martha had passed her whole life in mistaking the nature and the value of almost every object around her the language of mary brotherton had shot with a painful and unwelcome brightness upon the dim and uncertain twilight of her moral perceptions and the unhappy girl learned to know that the only being who had ever seemed to love her or whom she had ever ventured to love was one that her better reason shrunk from and her sober judgment condemned yet still he was her father and still she loved him and gladly joyfully would she have given her young life could she thereby have changed his love of gold for love of mercy sometimes she thought that time and age would teach him the hollowness of his present pursuits and that if she never left him but ever stood ready at his side to watch some favourable moment she might have the surpassing joy of seeing his heart open to the truth and in a state to permit her helping to lead him to efficient repentance and the all-merciful forgiveness of god it was impossible but that such thoughts and feelings must separate her more than ever from the rest of her family and she had already pretty generally received the epithet of methodistical from the whole neighbourhood but she hailed it as a blessing and without a shadow of religious enthusiasm beyond what was almost inevitable under the circumstances and with no sectarian views or notions whatever poor martha gladly sheltered herself under the imputation of both in order to avoid joining in scenes of amusement for which she had no relish in such a state of mind it was natural enough that martha should deem a visit to the bereaved mother a penance which it was her duty to perform though it was more painful to her perhaps than almost any other to which she could have been subjected and she did perform it accordingly she found the poor sufferer whose eye she dreaded to meet sinking fast into peace and rest but never more could be disturbed miss brotherton and fanny were both with her a bible was in the hands of the former and mrs armstrong's countenance though greatly more pinched and pallid than she had ever before seen it expressed a tranquil calmness which it was impossible to contemplate without pleasure but alas for poor martha she had the pang of seeing this consoled and consoling look suddenly change to an expression of intense suffering the moment her own person met the poor woman's eye they had never seen each other since the fatal morning on which martha had so innocently persuaded her to sign the articles of her boy's apprenticeship and the recollection of that scene and all its consequences could not so suddenly come upon one reduced already to almost the last stage of weakness without shaking her terribly the distended eye the open mouth the heaving breast all spoke a degree of agitation which in her condition was frightfully alarming and mary who dreaded lest the calmness of her last moment should be disturbed hastily turned to the intruder and said go go the sight of you will kill her though there was no more of harshness in this than the urgent circumstances of the case seemed to call for mary brotherton would have rather died than utter it could she have guessed the pang it gave to the already wounded heart of poor martha she made no reply but fixing on the victim of her most innocent delusion a look just long enough to impress the terrible expression of her countenance upon her own heart for ever she turned away and reached her splendid home in a state of mind that seemed fearfully to verify the annunciation he will visit the sins of the fathers upon the children that day was the last of the widow's life and it is probable it might have been so even if martha dowling had not made her unfortunate visit but the coincidence was fatal to the poor girl's peace for the anxious inquiries she made respecting her brought the intelligence of her death and the time of it with sufficient accuracy to leave no doubt on martha's mind that the event had been accelerated by her appearance happily however for those who tenderly watched her last moments the widow armstrong's gentle nature permitted her not long to suffer from the irritation which the presence of martha produced and many hours before she closed her eyes for ever she expressed her sorrow for having yielded so weakly to feelings which she had hoped were altogether conquered assuring mary who never left her 
that she acquitted the young lady of all intention to deceive her and that the shock she felt from seeing her only proceeded from the vivid recollections her appearance awakened unhappily however it was long ere this healing assurance reached poor martha for miss brotherton who was far from guessing its importance to her had decided upon having no further intercourse with the dowling family a resolution which would never have been taken had her last interview with martha at milford park ended more pleasantly but it had been already so long acted upon that it would have been equally awkward and disagreeable to break through it and martha long continued in the terrible persuasion that she had been accessory to the death of both mother and son the loss of the only relatives he had ever known following as they did so closely on each other made mary tremble for the health of edward she had watched the affecting close of the poor widow's life with all the tender feeling such a spectacle was calculated to excite in such a heart as hers she had mourned for michael for many reasons and mourned sincerely but she had hardly known the boy and it was her sympathy with the sorrow of others rather than her own which caused the event to touch her so deeply but to edward she had become attached with so much fondness and he had inspired such a feeling of wondering admiration in her mind by the extraordinary faculties he displayed and the justness and uprightness of every thought and feeling that to watch over his health and welfare had become nearly the first object of her isolated existence the few months which had elapsed since the whole system of his life had been changed from all that was most injurious to health to a mode of living in every way conducive to its recovery had produced a more favourable and decisive effect on him than could have been reasonably hoped for in the time and it was a remarkable evidence of the powerful influence which such a change produces on the frame that not all the sorrow and suffering which miss brotherton's intelligence brought or the heart-wringing loss which followed it could check the active energy of benignant nature in restoring health where all she required for it was given and all that had hitherto impeded her kindly operations was removed yet edward was still lame though so much less so than he had been that his benefactress could not help indulging a hope that time and judicious treatment might remove the infirmity altogether for some reason or other miss brotherton entertained no very particular respect for the medical practitioners of her immediate neighbourhood and for several months after her return she contented herself with following mr bell's prescriptions for friction and moderate exercise without calling in any medical assistance at all but though the improvement that followed was very perceptible it was not rapid and the idea of london advice suggested itself as the most satisfactory mode of ascertaining at once whether a perfect recovery might be hoped for information which it was very desirable she should obtain before she decided in what way she should bring him up since the death of his mother milford park had been edward's home and the orphan boy's hold on miss brotherton's warm heart had been greatly increased by the opportunities this gave her of more frequent intercourse with her in truth though he still attended the school for an hour or two every morning by far the more important portion of his education went on under her own eye and as well as that of his little companion fanny was beginning to take a form and extent totally different from what she had at first intended for either of them ideas respecting them both began by degrees to arise in her mind which she at first endeavoured to resist as being too much out of the usual course to be safely indulged in but use lessens marvel and the notion of making a man of learning of edward and a woman of fortune of fanny which once and again she had rejected as too romantic and absurd gradually grew into an habitual theme of meditation on which her fancy delighted to fix itself mary brotherton was at that time about twenty-two years old extremely pretty and moreover almost childishly young-looking for her age and whatever she might have brought herself to think of it most others would very naturally have deemed her adopting a boy of twelve and a girl of eleven a most outrageously preposterous and imprudent act but her situation was one in most respects quite out of the common way and she every day felt it more impossible that she should continue to endure the station of one of the magnates of a manufacturing neighbourhood with all eyes fixed upon everything she did and her whole heart and soul recoiling from companionship with the only persons whom her neighbours and watchers would deem fit to be her particular friends the heart of this isolated girl was so clingingly affectionate that it is probable she would under almost any other circumstances have at least loved the beautiful mansion in which she had passed the greatest part of her life and felt the trees and flowers that adorned it to be as companions and familiar friends but a thousand painful thoughts were mingled with the consciousness that she was mistress of that fair domain 
and the very fact that the education she felt inclined to bestow upon the two orphans would bring down upon her the criticisms and probably the reprobation of the whole neighbourhood making it very desirable that the extraordinary project should be carried into execution elsewhere was in her estimation more in its favour than against it when in addition to all this she succeeded in persuading herself from some of her miscellaneous reading that there were german baths which might assist the restoration of edward's limbs and that it was her duty to consult the most approved authorities upon his case the decision to leave milford park and remove to london was at no great distance had her valued friend and counsellor mr bell led her to believe that all the wealth she had if thrown back among the class from which it was drawn could have sufficed to remedy the evils under which they groaned she was quite capable of stripping herself to her last shilling for the purpose but he knew better and he taught her to know better too and having convinced himself that her best chance of happiness as well as her best opportunity of doing good would be in yielding to the affection which her boy and girl had inspired he promised to assist her projected removal by seeing that the orders she left respecting her property were faithfully executed and about eight months after the death of mrs armstrong the heiress left her parks and gardens her splendid mansion and all its gorgeous appurtenances to attend the orphan boy to london the consultation which immediately after her arrival there took place upon the case of edward was productive of perhaps the greatest pleasure mary had ever known for the sentence unanimously pronounced was that the limbs of the boy were in a state of progress towards perfect recovery the weakness and distortion brought on by his employment not having lasted long enough to produce any deformity capable of resisting the tendency of nature to recover herself if not impeded by any fresh unhealthy influence that any such should arise to disappoint her hopes was not likely all that was required for him being good air regular and moderate exercise wholesome food and abstinence from all violent exertion for the next year or two as to her question respecting german baths the answer was less unanimous two gentlemen being of opinion that they would do no good at all two that it was doubtful whether the case would be affected by them or not and one that great benefit might probably ensue but as all were of opinion that change of air was desirable and as a pretty strong inclination to try fresh fields and pastures new seconded this judgment miss brotherton determined to start for the rhine mrs tremlett declared that she had not the slightest objection to foreign parts edward's heart swelled with an ecstasy made up of gratitude hope curiosity and the delicious exhilaration attendant upon returning health while fanny looked around her and listened to every one whose words referred to the expedition with a very delightful consciousness of being wide awake but not without some fear that she was dreaming nevertheless such was the party that filled the travelling carriage of miss brotherton while an english maid a french footman and a german courier formed her suit nothing certainly could be well more whimsical than the party with which she had thus surrounded herself but this mattered little since she was pleased with it and we must leave her in the full enjoyment of a whole host of delightful feelings while we return to follow the fortunes of poor michael End of chapter twenty six chapter twenty seven part one of the life and adventures of michael armstrong factory boy this is a librivox recording chapter twenty seven michael armstrong sets out upon a dangerous expedition its termination proves rather more than he can bear he meets a good man and takes service under him he asks and obtains a holiday and meets several adventures in the course of it part one while this gay and happy party who would any of them have gladly exchanged pleasure for pain could they thereby have purchased only the knowledge of his existence were thus placing kingdoms between them the unhappy michael was still enduring all the miseries of an apprentice at the deep valley mill it would be difficult to imagine a stronger contrast in the situation of two brothers than that which many subsequent years presented between him and edward edward who had ever been to him as a dearer second self who had never enjoyed a pleasure unshared by him and never known a sorrow that had not also been his edward was enjoying all that nature and fortune could give while michael still hopelessly dragged on a wretched existence amidst unceasing and unvarying suffering at length the desperate resolution was formed which put the officials at the deep valley factory in the state of activity already described and where was michael the while safely ensconced in a sort of rude drain 
which he had himself assisted to construct when he held the regretted office of scavenger of the court and over the aperture of which he easily arranged sticks and rubbish sufficient to conceal him michael lay for many hours listening to the hubbub which his absence occasioned he distinctly heard the expression of mrs poulet's anger and scorn as messenger after messenger returned without bringing tidings of him and had moreover the advantage of knowing the track that he had purposely made on the grass which grew tall and rank immediately behind the factory had led them and would continue to lead them all one way while he would of course take a special care to go another having left his footmarks on the grass in the manner described michael had scrambled through the bushes which covered the steep hillside for the distance of a few hundred yards and then taking advantage of a layer of stones by which a patch of marshy ground had been rendered firm he again crossed from the hill towards the factory without leaving any trace behind by this simple device his pursuers were completely thrown out for when night came and he crawled out of his shelter no eye was open to look for him close to his prison walls though very keen ones were busy elsewhere in search of him the same strength of frame which had enabled him to escape deformity in the mill helped him well now as without food without sleep and with every pulse throbbing between hope and fear he strode rapidly onward on the road he had come with parsons four years before carefully avoiding its grassy margin however lest more footsteps might be traced then revolving with great clearness of local recollection the direction in which this road led after mounting the hill he firmly resolved as long as his strength lasted to pursue it till it brought him to the door of his mother's home provided always that he was not stopped short by the grasp of an overlooker in the way the necessity of procuring food had not appeared to him any obstacle to the undertaking for not only had he great faith in his own power of enduring abstinence but he had faith too in the impossibility of begging at a farmhouse door for a morsel of bread in vain nor did either hope deceive him he walked till nightfall with no other refreshment than water caught in the hollow of his hand from a trickling roadside spring and a few blackberries snatched in terror as he hurried on as the darkness thickened round him he called a council with himself as to whether it would be wisest to lay down under the shelter of a hayrick and let sleep serve him for supper or to venture a petition for a morsel of food at a decent-looking mansion which he saw at some distance and walk on through the night if he succeeded by help of the strength so recruited after so many anxious reasonings pro and con he at last decided upon the latter and so well did his handsome face and simple assurance that he was very hungry plead for him that he not only obtained scraps sufficient for a hearty supper but a crust or two for the following morning and with this treasure he trudged on footsore indeed and with a pretty strong inclination to lie down and sleep but mental energy sufficed for many hours to conquer bodily fatigue and it was not till past three o'clock the next morning that he yielded and at last laid himself down in a dry and as he thought it most delightful comfortable ditch and slept the sleep of youth and weariness for three or four hours the bright beams of an autumn sun shooting directly upon his eyes awakened him and he started up ready and able to walk forward sufficiently thankful for the hoarded crusts in his pocket he was now not more than seven miles from ashley a fact which she joyfully ascertained by a milestone on a road which he had reached he hardly knew how but it must have been missing not hitting the way he had endeavoured to find for parsons had not followed the high road from the town for more than a mile and that was before sir matthew's carriage overtook him michael looked backwards and forwards along this wide unsheltered road and trembled to think how easy it would be to see and recognize a fugitive from any spot within sight of it but there was a burning impatience at his heart when he thought of home and remembered that he was within two hours walk of it which left all caution far behind and commending himself to god he set off at the fleetest pace he could achieve towards ashley no system of pursuit however alarmed him from the moment he quitted the mills to that when he reached what had once been his mother's door no terror of the kind had come near him he had heard no whispering voices nor seen shadowy figures stealing towards him from a distance all he had most feared was got through with ease but all he had most fondly hoped turned out a fearful blank as michael drew near the door he remembered so well every object which met his eye that he began to fear lest he himself might be remembered by others and making a circuit to avoid sir matthew's mills he reached hoxley lane without having met a single face he knew it was a tremendous moment for him that in which he first caught sight of the lowly door through which he had passed a thousand times in eager anticipation of his mother's kiss 
some minutes followed before he could reach it and the boy trembled so violently that he tottered as he hurried onward like a drunken man at length his hand was on the latch it yielded as in days of yore and in an instant the door was wide open before him poor michael what death can have a pang so bitter as that he felt when the almost impossible project of reaching his mother's home being performed he found that home empty and desolate and telling him as plainly as angels trumpet-tongued could do that she was dead a dismal groan burst from him and he sunk on the floor just where he had last stood gaily talking to her of his bright fancies for the future a few hours before he was snatched away from her for ever the noise he made reached the ears of a woman in the front room and she opened the door of communication to ascertain who it could be rummaging in the empty room that was to let my gracious i should like to know who you are what do you want here you ragamuffin is this the way you come to take lodgings pray this was said by a young and pretty woman who held a baby in her arms and who being the wife of a confidential overlooker had not only succeeded to the occupation of number twelve upon the death of mrs sykes and the dispersion of her family but considered herself privileged to assume on most occasions an air of great importance mother lived here said michael with a look wretched enough to soften the heart of the saucy girl who had addressed him your mother my poor boy are you the little orphan armstrong then was the reply is mother dead said the unhappy boy dead to be sure she is and where can you have been not to know that wasn't you with her when she died no 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 sobbed michael i came to find her poor fellow that's dismal enough to be sure i bean't ashley born but i have heard a deal since i comed here about the widow armstrong and the boy as died died echoed michael looking wildly at her is he dead too is my poor teddy dead surely he is replied the unthinking young woman who in truth knew nothing about either the widow armstrong or her son but remembered hearing that a little more than a year before she took possession of the premises a widow armstrong had died in the back room for grief at having lost a boy she was far from intending to be cruel to the poor lad who looked himself so very nearly like a corpse but was too indifferent upon all subjects which did not immediately concern herself to take the trouble of thinking before she spoke a few more questions might probably have obtained if not the truth at least some proof of his informer's ignorance of it but michael had heard enough he rose to his feet and without uttering another word rushed out of the room the state in which he then found himself was certainly nearly approaching to delirium his strength of body and mind completely exhausted by fatigue fasting and intense anxiety the blow which had fallen upon him was heavier than his reason could bear and he wandered forth into the fields without knowing where he was or having any distinct idea of what had befallen him his devious and unheeded path led him to a spot at the distance of nearly a mile from his former home at which several miniature rocks of sandstone give something of wildness and dignity to the little stream which for the most part runs tamely enough and looks little more than a wide and dirty ditch as it passes through the town of ashley a multitude of cotton factories with their tall chimneys mocking the heavens were visible in the distance on the other side and the boy stopped in his wild hurried walk to gaze upon them with a feverish consciousness that there at least stood something he had seen before a frightful flash of memory then shot across his brain his mother dead his darling edward dead himself a houseless friendless starving wretch who soon would be caught and carried back to the prison-house he ran from only to learn that he had no friend on earth such were the thoughts which racked him as he stood upon the edge of the rocky little precipice and fixed his eyes upon the quiet water that flowed some twenty feet beneath him it seemed to present an image of coolness and repose his burning lips longed to kiss the gentle ripple on its surface he drew nearer to the extremest verge i should be safe there he murmured looking downwards till his sick head reeled god forgive me he added raising his eyes to heaven but if i drown mother i shall go to thee and as he spoke the words he sprang forward and plunged into the stream the shock restored his wandering senses in a moment he felt that he was perishing though unconscious that it was by his own act and forgetting how little reason he had to wish for life struggled hard to grasp a bush that protruded from the bank in the stream 
but he could not swim and the efforts he made though they served for a minute or two to keep him afloat only increased the distance between himself and the object he endeavoured to reach his heavy shoes filled with water and dragged him downwards his strength failed his arm ceased to move and in another moment the water rippled over his head but poor michael's history was not finished yet a heavy-looking elderly man who had as little as possible the air of one desirous of seeking an adventure was in the act of examining some sheep in a field the fence of which was not fifty yards from the rocky ledge from whence the boy had sprung having completed his survey and directed two men who were with him to select a score or two from the lot the old man reposed himself upon a stile in the fence above mentioned and having chanced to turn his head from the sheep towards the spot where michael stood had watched for a minute or two the boy's agitated movements and demeanour but without the slightest suspicion of the frightful catastrophe that was to ensue no sooner however did he hear the splash occasioned by the plunge than he sprang over the stile with the activity of a younger man and calling to the others to follow him made his way with little loss of time to a bit of pebbly ground on a level with the stream and at no great distance from the point at which michael had sunk but short as the time had been the ripple had already disappeared from the surface of the water and no trace remained of the object of his search the two young men whom he had summoned to follow him though they had not seen the accident had gathered from his words that something terrible had occurred and clambering down the rocky cliff were by his side in a moment it is too late lads exclaimed the old man wringing his hands together i saw the poor distracted creature take the leap but he was sunk before i got to the bank and i take it he will never rise again i shall never forgive myself for not going to him when i saw him throwing his arms about in that wild way i might have guessed what was going to happen and may heaven forgive me for not preventing it tis a man who has thrown himself in inquired one of the men not a man but a fine young lad as ever you see poor fellow twas early days for him to have found sorrow enough to throw himself out of life that way if i had ran to him as i ought to have done and stopped the deed who knows but we might have brought him around to a better manner of thinking tis ten to one that he'll come to the top again yet if he hasn't done it already said the man but if he comes he'll come dead william replied the old man i don't know that rejoined the young shepherd the stream runs briskish round yon corner and would carry him right away with it but it's worth while having a look lower down if he rises at all twill be there and so saying the young man set off at a swifter pace than his master could follow him while the old man and the shepherd lad continued for a minute or two to watch the place where he had fallen halloo 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 cried a voice at no great distance that's william by all that's good exclaimed the young shepherd and without waiting for his companion's reply he ran off at full speed the old man following with no lagging step and at the distance of a few yards after turning the corner formed by another huge mass of sandstone rock they perceived william breast deep in the water and grasping at the utmost extent of his arm a limb of the drowning boy before the old westmoreland statesman for such he was could overtake his young companions the hero of our tale was lying high and dry upon the bank but whether life was quite extinct or still lingered in the cold coarse-like form between them was a question which when the old man joined the group the young ones were not able to answer luckily for michael the old statesman had seen a man saved from drowning some thirty years before and he remembered enough of the process he had then witnessed to enable him to give some very useful instructions on the present occasion they managed to make their patient discharge from his mouth some portion of the superfluous draught he had swallowed and after bestowing patient and assiduous friction on his breast and limbs they had the great satisfaction of seeing the chest heave with returning respiration and all other symptoms of revivification follow in their proper order till the eyes of michael were once more widely opened and fixed with perplexity and something like terror on the faces which were bending over him thank heaven ejaculated the old man earnestly he's safe now at least from drowning and i have not got that to answer for but he isn't in a trim to be left my lads he would have been as well in the river perhaps as out of it if we do no more for him then causing michael to sit and examining his features with a glance of very friendly curiosity he said 
you don't look like a bad boy my poor fellow what could have set you upon doing such a desperate action the effort which the poor boy made to answer was ineffectual and he only shook his head i suppose it's over soon as yet to expect any information from him resumed the old man so there's nothing to be done as i see but just to carry him up between us if he cannot walk to the nag's head and have him laid upon my bed there till he is in a condition to tell us something about himself can you feel your legs yet my boy he continued endeavouring by the help of his man william to make him stand up but michael had no power to second their efforts the two lads therefore raised him head and heels and preceded by the grey-haired farmer bore him between them above a mile to the humble hostelry of the nag's head the procession was too remarkable a one to escape notice and before it reached the shelter of the little inn a miscellaneous crowd of men women and children had joined it many of these had been familiar with the features of poor michael in days of yore but not one of them recognized the widow armstrong's boy in the long-limbed pallid figure that they now gazed upon muster thornton the westmoreland yeoman and farmer was too substantial a customer to be refused any reasonable favour and the ragged dripping michael was not only permitted to lie down on muster thornton's best of beds but accommodated promptly with dry linen and duly comforted with more hot brandy water sugar and biscuits than he had any inclination to swallow he took enough however to remove the faintness of inanition and this together with dry linen and a bed sufficed in spite of the heavy sorrows upon which his mind had not yet dared to fix itself to soothe him into a long and healing sleep when he awoke from it he was capable of answering all the questions mr thornton put to him and this he did with a simplicity of pathos that went straight to the good man's heart that he had been working in a distant cotton factory where he had been very hardly treated and having got away to see his mother and his brother had found them both dead was a tale that if it could not excuse the desperate act which he had attempted at least accounted for it in a manner that left as much to pity as to blame poor boy poor boy exclaimed the old man with tears in his eyes it was wrong and wicked very wrong and wicked but you must pray god to forgive you my boy and never think of any such desperate doings more i did not know what i was about if i remember rightly said michael my head seemed gone i don't know how i got to the river but i am sure i did not go there on purpose so much the better i am glad to hear it and it's no great wonder sure enough if you did lose your head coming to such a home as that but what are you to do next my poor fellow i suppose there is no other home for you is there i have no home nor a single friend in the whole world replied michael and the only work you have ever been used to i suppose is following the wheels in the factories said the farmer except once for three months and a bit that i was kept to cleaning the outhouses and yard and wheeling away garden rubbish and such like replied michael well but that's better than nothing boy at any rate you know how to hold a spade which is a long deal better than having never used your fingers except for tying bits of thread do you think you should be willing to work for me my boy and tend my farmyard stock and do a turn of work in the fields when it was wanted i should be willing sir replied michael while a flush passed over his pale face i should be willing and most thankful to work for you that's well said the old man cheerily and as to terms i don't expect we shall find much difficulty you will come to me my poor fellow much in the same condition as you first come into the world therefore all you want i must find which will be about as much as i can afford to give i take it just at first till you and i too find out what you're good for will you agree to it my lad and give me your time and best endeavours for clothes food lodging and good will it will be a blessed bargain for me sir said michael if you will add to all your goodness the excusing my ignorance but if will was all that was wanting to make a good servant you should not lose by me and will is all that is wanting boy you are no fool i take it by your looks and if you will mind what is said and do your best i shall ask no more what is your name my good fellow michael michael armstrong sir well then michael armstrong i am your master and you are my man and now you must eat 
and then you must go to sleep again i think till i have got some decent clothes for you those you wore yesterday have had a good washing to be sure nevertheless i don't justly like the looks of them within six months from this time michael armstrong promoted to a place of trust might have been sitting upon the hillside in one of the most romantic spots in westmoreland a shepherd's maud wrapped round his person a sheep-dog at his feet and his master's flocks nibbling the short grass around him on all sides many were the solitary hours he thus passed and very rich was the harvest they brought him had the boy remained a year or two longer in the state that quote, blocks out the forms of nature preconsumes the reason famishes the heart shuts up the infant being in itself and makes its very spring a season of decay Asterisk. had michael remained a year or two longer at the deep valley factory in the state thus admirably and accurately described it would have been too late for any contemplation of god's works to have roused his withered spirit to worship and to hope but as it was his mind seemed to awaken day by day from the long and heavy sleep in which it had been plunged with an intellect naturally vigorous and covetous of acquirement and having had his first infant stretch of thought happily and indelibly directed though with primeval simplicity to one god and father of all his transition from a condition in which quote, scarcely could you fancy that a gleam could break from out those languid eyes asterisk to one quote, sublime from present purity and joy asterisk wordsworth was rapid and delightful his heavy losses were not forgotten but while he meditated beneath the bright arch of heaven on the mother and the brother he had so fondly loved there were so many sublime and hope-inspiring thoughts mixed with his sorrow that it could hardly have been called painful the worthy statesman to whose service he had bowed himself though he did not perhaps follow michael through all the improving processes which his mountain occupation led to nor very clearly comprehend the elevating effect of the skyey influences under which he lived was no way slow in perceiving that the samaritan feeling he had so opportunely displayed in the township of ashley had bound to his service one of the most trustworthy active and intelligent lads he had ever met with there is always moreover in the human heart a propensity to cherish whatever we have preserved and this feeling joined to his more worldly-minded approbation of michael's good gifts rendered muster thornton exceedingly fond of the boy and well inclined at all times to grant him every reasonable indulgence but michael rarely taxed his kindness as far as it was ready to go once he had asked and obtained leave to mount to the top of helvellyn and once to make a sabbath day's journey over the mountain tops to oswater these were the only occasions on which he had expressed any wish to wander beyond the immediate neighbourhood of the farmer's sheep walks and in truth this immediate neighbourhood included so many mountain torrents glassy lakes stupendous crags and sylvan solitudes that there was little need to go beyond it in order to gratify a passion for the picturesque but when michael had attained the age of eighteen years a longing and somewhat restless desire seized him to revisit the place of his birth to seek for the graves of his mother and edward to learn tidings of the kind-hearted martha to discover if possible whether his own escape from the deep valley had been communicated to sir matthew and to ascertain whether he still stood in any danger of being reclaimed as an apprentice in case of its being discovered that he was at liberty as to any danger of being personally recognized at ashley he feared it not conscious that from his remarkably tall stature and florid health he was too unlike the factory boy of former days to run any risk of being known it was however some months after this wish first suggested itself before he took courage to name it to his indulgent master when at length however he did so the good man not only gave his free consent but declared himself well pleased that such a project had entered his favourite's head it will do thee a power of good mike said he the only fault i have to find with thee is that thee be is too steady for a lad of thy years and that looks as if with all our care and coaxing we have not yet been able to make thee forget thy sorrowful childhood set off in god's name my boy stay as long as thou wilt but only promise to come back at last for i think it would be heart-aching work to part with thee michael gratefully promised a speedy return and dressed in his best attire he set forth upon his much wished for pilgrimage to his early home it was the pride the spring-tide of the year 
every leaf was opened yet every leaf retained the new-born freshness of its lovely green the birds saluted him from every bush the herds lowed from amidst their dewy banquet in a note that spoke their measureless content and every object on which his bright young eye fixed itself seemed to echo the abounding gladness of his own heart how elastic was the step with which he passed along how proudly and thankfully did he feel conscious of his own high place amidst this wondrous creation and how perfectly was he convinced despite all he had read during his lone hours on the mountain side of the splendour of the cities of the earth that nothing on its whole surface could exceed in grace and glory the majesty of the gorgeous sun as he rose triumphantly from out his bed of gold had every thought of the boy's heart been chronicled a very poetical sort of hymn would have been the result but as it was all the glowing thankfulness the heavenward rapture and the joy supreme was but for himself alone yet was it not thrown away for michael enjoyed his own existence during these early hours with an intensity that made him feel all his former sufferings most benignantly overpaid by his present happiness yet in the midst of this tears more than once started to his eyes as he thought of his mother and the brother he had so entirely loved his very soul longed to have edward by his side as various fancies chased each other through his fertile brain and the image of little fanny too with her soft reasoning eyes as she used to look at him when preaching patience at the deep valley mill as he fondly laboured to recall it made him sigh in the midst of his pleasure and his freedom to think how sad it was that all he had ever loved should have passed away from his eyes for ever but amidst the million proofs of tender commiseration for the sufferings incident of necessity to our place in creation which those who run may read if they are not very great dunces indeed there is perhaps none more remarkable than the gradual softening of the agony which all who survive what they love are doomed to feel the state which follows though as sad as the darkness of the lonely night made visible by the pale backward glances of the parting moon has the same soothing stillness too passion is over anxiety at rest and we feel more than consoled we feel joyful as we remember that we too shall pass away and follow them the journey to ashley cost michael three days smart walking but his pockets were no longer in the condition they had been at the time of his never-to-be-forgotten escape from the deep valley he had proved himself a good and faithful servant and the worthy yeoman paid him accordingly so that he had wherewithal to recruit his spirits and his strength as he jogged along and reached the hospitable nag's head in his native town on the third evening rather the better than the worse for his pleasant toil his first walk on the following morning was to ashley churchyard but here he was obliged to content himself by knowing that the dear relics of those he wished to honour were near him for of course the only indication by which he could guess whereabouts these precious relics lay was to be found in the want of all memorial on the sunny side of ashley churchyard a number of handsome tombstones may be seen many a massive monument is there protected by its strong and stately rail and thereon may be read by those who list the important fact that some one who bore a christian appellation lies below to the north where the grass grows strongest though the sun never comes to cheer it are a multitude of little nameless unclaimed hillocks closely wedged together and rarely showing even a withy band across the swelling sod to testify that some one has cared for what lay hidden under it to this green republic michael turned himself and knew full surely that it was there his mother lay another though even as humble as himself might under similar feelings have addressed inquiries to the parish sexton and endeavoured to set his memory to work as to the exact spot where he had buried her but this michael dared not do for it would be at once losing the advantage of his incognito and laying himself very needlessly open to the danger of being reclaimed by his old enemy sir matthew as a bound apprentice who had run away so he contented himself with walking carefully and with reverential tread through and amongst the many grassy mounds permitting his tears to flow freely as he thought of teddy and the dear gentle mother who had so equally loved them both and then turned slowly away following a path that brought him at the distance of a mile or so to brookford factory the sensation which he felt when the great many-eyed monster first met his sight was one of unmixed pleasure he literally hugged himself and blessed the freedom of his limbs the firm and healthy action of his pulse and the delicious consciousness that he was no man's slave for many minutes he stood still to enjoy this 
and as his eyes perused line after line of the dusky smoke-stained windows and recalled the early sufferings he had endured within them his very heart swelled with gratitude for the change and he blessed god aloud but as he approached nearer and perceived the dim shadowy figures slowly moving here and there and thought upon the condition of each of them he almost repented of his selfish joy and blamed the ecstasy that for a while had made him so utterly forget that thousands were imprisoned still though he was free on and on he walked with his eyes immovably fixed upon the hideous fabric till sooner than he expected it he stood before the gates he had conceived no previous plan by which to enter it and knew that without some specific business real or feigned it would be impossible but while he stood weighing the danger of possible discovery against his very strong inclination to see what alteration time had made in the troop within whether he should recognize any among them and whether his old tyrant parsons was still their chief the grates opened and one of the engine-men a grisly fellow whom he well remembered when his sable hair was somewhat less silvered came forth he gave michael a look that very plainly said what do you want and in truth his neat appearance unstained skin and free unshrinking eye very naturally suggested the idea that he could have no business there is mr parsons within said michael boldly and daring the inquiry as much because he knew not what to say as from any deliberate resolution to do so yes replied the man he is about the place somewhere i seed him not more than ten minutes ago michael nodded his head and walked through the gate into the court across which he had passed in trembling a thousand times nor was he now quite free from a slight feeling of alarm at the idea of meeting the sharp eyes of his former terrible taskmaster and felt much inclined to blame himself for the curious temerity which had brought him so nearly within his gripe but it was too late to retreat for at the distance of a dozen yards he saw parsons before him coming forth from the building into the court on seeing the stranger he immediately approached him michael touched his hat end of chapter twenty seven part one chapter twenty seven part two of the life and adventures of michael armstrong the factory boy this is a librivox recording part two what may your business here be young man said parsons eyeing him from top to toe i called in sir to inquire whether you happen to want a spinner and what the wages may be said michael is it for yourself demanded parsons knitting his brows and looking at him with a sort of incredulous sneer why no sir it is for a kinsman who happens to be out of employ replied michael colouring from the unusual consciousness of deceit and from the same cause casting his eyes upon the ground thereby displaying the remarkable length of his black eyelashes and giving to his whole countenance a look much more resembling that of former days than he had worn when he first entered parsons looked at him with a sort of vague idea that he had seen him before where do you come from said he from westmoreland sir i have been living in service there for these four years past and pray what may your name be robert thornton sir replied michael blushing again as he thus unceremoniously borrowed the appellation of his worthy master have you ever worked in a factory yourself yes sir i have when i was a boy said michael from mere want of skill and hardihood in the art of lying and you think you have bettered yourself i suppose with your fine buff waistcoat and the rest of it no we don't want no spinners here michael by no means unwillingly obeyed this dismissal and walked away more than half ashamed of his achievement if i didn't know that michael armstrong was dead i should swear that their chap was him said a girl somewhat older than our imprudent masquerader and who had been watching him very earnestly during the foregoing conversation the observation was not addressed to the overlooker but to another girl who had brought the speaker her dinner to prevent her leaving some particular work on which she was employed what's that you say sykes said parsons turning quickly towards her i was saying sir as that boy was unaccountable like michael armstrong as used to live in mother's back kitchen he wasn't above a year or two younger than me and i knowed him as well as i did my own brothers stuff and nonsense girl all the world knows that young rascal died years ago and fuss enough there was made about it by that mad miss at milford who i suppose found out that she was their cousin or something of the sort for she took it so to heart that she sold her house and lands and ran away with another of em to some foreign country for fear he should die too 
sure you must mind all that queer story yes sir replied the girl i remember it right well and that's the reason why i says that i know it can't be him yet upon my soul now you mention it he was the very image of him i fancied as i looked at him that surely i had seen him somewhere before but it can't be a dead dog is dead all the world over yes sure sir responded kitty sykes who being what is called a very sightly girl was not unfrequently indulged with a little condescending notice from mr parsons but twas his queer curly black hair and his particular looking eyes as put it into my head and if you go on talking of it sykes in that way you will be putting it into my head too and after all there is nothing so very impossible in it nobody in these parts could really know much about it you see and there's no reason as i can tell why the scamp might have not run away from the deep that is the stocking weaver's manufacture as he was sent prentice to and as they ought to have stopped him might have given out that he was dead replied the overlooker then if it was possible resumed kitty sykes i wouldn't mind taking my bodily oath that that there young fellow was michael armstrong and nobody else egad i wish i hadn't let him go cried parsons running to the gates he was prentice till twenty-one and if he has run away he's liable to be taken up and put in prison by the first as catches him kitty sykes took the liberty of running to the gates also but to say the truth she had no wish at all that mr parsons should catch him up and put him into prison the girl though she had prudence enough not to communicate the opinion to her friend mr parsons thought the stranger by far the handsomest young fellow she had ever seen and secretly determined if she could catch sight of him again that she would give him a hint to keep clear of his old acquaintance there he goes cried parsons watching michael as with upright gait and rapid strides he was pursuing his way by the well-remembered path which led from the factory to dowling lodge there he goes he don't look like one of the mill people anyway and yet the fellow said that he had worked in a factory didn't you hear him kitty yes sir replied the girl and it was just then that i felt so unaccountable sure that unless it was out and out impossible it must be michael armstrong as was speaking i never did see such eyes of michael's not such hair neither and there he goes i'll bet a sovereign rejoined the overlooker to take a look at his old quarters at the lodge kitty i'll give you a glass of gin and a shilling if you'll run after him you can run like a hare i know run and bring him back kitty there's a darling and say as i've got some good news to tell him off started the girl with right good will having her own reasons for wishing to do the errand as well as a very sufficient inclination to gain the promised reward mr parsons by no means overrated her running powers and had she been less fleet she would have failed in her object for michael walked briskly and without any inclination to remain longer in the vicinity of the mill though by no means conscious that he had been recognized he had just turned the corner of a hedge when the girl overtook him so that their colloquy did not take place within sight of the overlooker michael heard the fair kitty's approach and turned to see who it was that thus came galloping and panting after him do you want me young woman said he civilly stopping for her well then you are no changeling replied the girl laying her hand on his arm you were always out and out the civilest boy in the mill a very bright suffusion dyed the clear brown of michael's cheek as he heard this i do not know what you mean he replied come come michael armstrong rejoined kitty you needn't be afraid of me don't you remember kitty sykes as have gone to and from the mill with you and teddy a hundred and a hundred times is it indeed kitty sykes grown into such a handsome young woman said michael holding out his hand to her and feeling quite incapable of preserving his incognito in the presence of so old an acquaintance and to think of your knowing me kitty but you must not betray me my dear girl if i was found out for michael armstrong i might get into a scrape and that's true and no lie answered the faithless ambassadress for i am sent after you by that old beast parsons to tell you to come back because he had good news for you but his news would be just to give you notice to march into prison for having run away and i agreed to carry his message for him he thinks that i delight in him the old monster but i'd rather walk a mile to do a kindness to you michael than stir an inch to please him god bless you my dear girl i hope you have done me a great service now for i think i could show him leg bail that he would find it difficult to refuse kitty so now good-bye old friend 
i am sorry to part so soon but it won't do to stay here to be caught will it no truly mike i'd be loath to see any friend of mine at his mercy or at that of his master either but you won't go clear away out of the country without seeing me again will you you needn't be afeard of him twill be easy enough to put him off the scent i'll back and tell that we was both of us altogether deceived and that you beant no more michael armstrong than he be i don't think i ought to stay in ashley now kitty there's others may know me as well as you and he and twould be a terrible change i can tell you my dear girl to come down from the hills where i am tending a good master's sheep and often feel so high and so happy that i think i am half way to heaven it would be a terrible change kitty to come from that into the deep valley mill again which is as much worse than our old factory here as hanging is worse than whipping lord have mercy upon em then ejaculated the poor girl but i say michael you needn't run no risk at all if i go back and say it isn't you and then you might meet me after nightfall in the town it will not be very long kitty before i am one and twenty and a free man and it's then please heaven that i'll come back again and pay the old place a visit you have been kind enough to remember me so long that i don't think you'll have forgotten me by that time and it shall go hard with me but i'll bring you a token from some of our north country fairs so saying he gave the damsel a kiss and she wrung his hand without making any further effort to detain him god bless you said the retreating michael over his shoulder and god bless you too you nice boy muttered poor kitty i wouldn't ask no better luck than just to follow you and keep sheep too either from wishing to look after him as long as he was in sight or for the purpose of giving him law in case mr parsons should determine on pursuit kitty sykes remained stationary on the spot where michael left her till abandoning his hardy project of a visit to dowling lodge he had stretched far away over the fields towards the road he was to pursue northwards to his peaceful home and then she walked leisurely back to the factory where after a sharp reproof for staying so long and a pert reply to it she informed the overlooker that they had both been wrong but that the young lad said he might be found if he was wanted at the sign of the magpie that was about a mile on the road towards london warned by this unexpected recognition michael determined to run no more risks among his town folks but not being disposed to lose the little bundle he had deposited at the nag's head he ensconced himself within the shelter of a small public house on the roadside resolved to wait there till the evening set in and then to venture back to his last night's lodging pay his bill reclaim his bundle and set forth upon a night march which he hoped would take him beyond all danger of mr parsons before the following morning having secured his welcome by the usual ceremony of ordering a meal michael looked about him for some means of occupation during the hours which he had doomed himself to pass there and in despair of finding any better literary amusement seized upon a heap of handbills of a vast variety of external forms but having as he found upon examination one and all the same object namely the calling together a general meeting of the whole county of york then undivided for the purpose of signing a petition to parliament for a law limiting the hours of labour in factories to ten hours a day michael armstrong was no longer a factory operative free as the air he breathed upon his beloved mountain-tops he no longer trembled at the omnipotent frown of an overlooker nor sickened as he watched the rising sun that was to set again long hours before his stifling labour ceased all this was over and ended with him for ever yet did his heart throb and his eye kindle as he perused page after page of the arousing call which summoned tens of thousands nay hundreds of thousands to use the right their country vested in them of imploring mercy and justice from the august tripartite power that ruled the land very powerful was the male and simple eloquence with which many of these unpretending compositions appealed to the paternal feelings of those they addressed and such terribly true representations were found among them of the well-remembered agonies of his boyhood that michael was fain to put his spread hand before his face to conceal the emotions they produced he had sat in this situation for some minutes revolving both his former sufferings and the blessedness of his present release from them when a man who had been quietly sitting writing at a distant window but had nevertheless found leisure to watch michael's countenance as he proceeded with his examination of the handbills rose from his place and gently approaching him said in deep yet very gentle voice you seem moved by the perusal of these papers my good friend is it the first time you have met with them yes indeed sir it is replied michael starting from his reverie 
then i presume you are a stranger in this part of the country why yes sir the master i serve is a westmoreland statesman and i am only come this way upon a holiday trip then maybe you don't care enough for the poor factory operatives to join their meeting and put your name to their petition if caring for them could do them any good master replied michael warmly they would be in no want of help as long as i was near them but i don't think the name of a poor servant boy like me could do them either honour or service then what sort of names my good lad do you suppose will support this petition do you think the great mill-owners will sign it do you think such men as sir matthew dowling for instance whom you may have heard spoken of down at ashley maybe do you think it will be such as he whose first object in life is to get as many hours of labour out of the little creatures that work for him as stripes can make them give do you think it will be such as he that will sign the ten hours bill not if that bill is either to hurt himself or better the children i should think said michael true enough replied his new acquaintance and not only is that true but he and the like of him will do all that mortal men can to prevent all others from signing it but heaven forbid they should succeed young man for if they do the best hope of many thousand suffering and most helpless human beings will fall to the ground then indeed may heaven forbid that they should have their will returned michael fervently when is this meeting to take place he added turning his eyes again to the papers he still held in his hand but three days hence truly i should like to witness it is there any reason against your doing it demanded the stranger will your services be wanted by your master before that time he won't expect me till two or three days after it replied michael i have done all i wanted at least i have stayed as long as i wished at ashley and i don't see any great harm there would be in witnessing the meeting do see it my good lad said the stranger i predict that it will offer a spectacle such as never was witnessed before and most likely never will or can be seen again a multitude probably amounting to above a hundred thousand overworked operatives will meet in peace and good order to petition for legal relief from the oppression of a system which has brought them to a lower state of degradation and misery than any to which human beings have ever been brought before were those in whom these poor people have confidence less deeply anxious to preserve the public peace than they are a different mode of redress might be sought for but as it is an honest man may venture to advise such a respectable young fellow as you seem to be to stretch your good master's leave a little in order to be present at this great spectacle a good deal more conversation followed on the same theme and ere michael had ceased to listen to his companion he felt convinced that duty as well as inclination would lead him to do all that a loyal subject and peaceable citizen could in aid of the suffering class from whose ranks he had so miraculously escaped in a word michael armstrong determined to attend the great yorkshire meeting and hold up his hand for the ten hours bill the extraordinary circumstances attending that enormous meeting the unaccountable disappointments which at every halting place attended all the precautionary efforts of the committee to procure bread for the multitude while beer was everywhere found ready and in the greatest abundance the terror felt by those most interested lest heat fatigue exhaustion and beer together might lead to some disturbance of the peace and the triumphant influence of reason and kindness joined in inducing the hungry multitude to separate peaceably are always matters of history and the narrative must therefore adhere to the fortunes of its hero without dwelling upon nobler themes in returning to ashley for his bundle michael took good care to be as little seen as possible he was in fact more than ever anxious to avoid detection as the more he meditated on his recollections of sir matthew dowling and parsons the more did he feel convinced that should he fall into their power before the age of twenty-one matters would go very hard with him at the great assembling of the people at york he feared not that he should encounter any enemy the only human beings whom he could so designate being likely to show themselves at the most distant part of the kingdom rather than before the face of the multitude to be expected there no feelings of distrust or alarm therefore arose to check the pleasurable excitement which this expedition was calculated to inspire and michael with his stout staff over his shoulder and the cotton handkerchief containing a change of linen suspended from it set out with a light heart and an active step upon a walk in which he soon found himself joined by many thousand companions 
the assurance given him by his unknown acquaintance that he should see a wonderful and spirit-stirring spectacle was fully verified the very sight of the road along which he travelled which looked like a dark and mighty current moving irresistibly along while tributary streams flowed into it on all sides so thick and serried was the mass that moved along it was of itself worth the toil it cost him to behold its peaceful tumult from time to time michael indulged in a little questioning of the various individuals beside whom he found himself but for the most part the men were too intent upon the object of their expedition to converse idly respecting it and by degrees our hero grew as silent as the rest and trudged on without any other communion than that of his own thoughts it was at about twenty miles distance from york when the multitude were on their return that a circumstance occurred which being of considerable importance to michael must be detailed somewhat at length he had entered an inn by the roadside which being one of the largest post-houses on the north road had an air of pretension and costliness about it that caused the great majority of the host to walk on without venturing to approach precincts so dangerous but michael was much exhausted and having already discovered when passing before the humbler houses of public entertainment that no rest could be hoped for from entering them every inch of space being occupied he deemed it wisest to disperse a splendid shilling rather than fag on till he had no strength to go further in pursuance of this reasoning he entered the kitchen of the royal oak and called for bread cheese and a pint of beer though there were not many of his fellow-travellers either rich or extravagant enough to share these splendid quarters with him there were nevertheless three or four men taking refreshment in the apartment one of these an elderly respectable-looking personage who had as it seemed exclusive possession of a snug little round table in a corner made a sign to michael to share it with him this was gratefully accepted the loaf and cheese were already there and the foaming tankard quickly followed i marked you at the meeting said his sociable companion it did my heart good to see a sprinkling here and there of them that come out of pure love and kindness to their poor fellow-creatures having nothing themselves to gain tis a pity and a sin too that so many englishmen stand idly by when such a business as this is afoot just as if they had nothing to do with it but they are one and all mistaken and that they may chance to find out too one of these days you give me credit for more than i deserve perhaps replied michael that is if you think my heart was enough with the poor factory folks to make me take a long roundabout to sign with them without having had some knowledge of their sufferings myself you are right in thinking that i am not one of them now but i have been and heaven forbid i should ever forget it for the keeping that time mind is quite enough to make everything that comes to me now seem light and easy you have worked in a factory said the other in an accent of surprise i should never have guessed as much but you are very rightful to be thankful for the present instead of ashamed for the past but i don't think he added eyeing the fine person of michael from head to foot i don't think i ever saw a lad who showed so little signs of having suffered in health and limb from it some lucky accident must have taken you away early i have seen many a boy and girl crippled for life replied michael before they were as old as i was when i ran away my good fellow whispered his companion don't you use them words again you are safe with me i promise you but if you ran from indentures you won't do wisely to tell of it you must blame your own kind and friendly looks said michael smiling i know well enough that what you say is true and it isn't a thing i should have told to many but excepting just now that i took a fancy to come back and take a look about the old place where i was born i have got so clear and clean away from mills and mill owners that i have grown rather bolder maybe than i ought to be my business now thank heaven is sheep tending upon the beautiful free hills of westmoreland you may well be thankful for such a change replied his friendly companion it must have been some unaccountable good luck for in general a runaway factory prentice is hunted down and caught long before he is got among the good hill folks it was indeed a blessed chance for me said michael with deep feeling i fell into the hands of the best man and the best master that ever a wretched runaway hit upon i almost wonder at you then venturing to come within sight of your own place again you can't be one and twenty yet by your looks and you would not over well like to work but your time in a factory i should think said the other i don't think i should 
replied michael laughing and i have run some risk i promised you already of the very thing you talk of since i left my master's house nothing would content my foolish fancy for calling back old times but going to look at the very factory where i first worked and talking to the identical tyrant who tortured me there but he did not know you i hope said the old man i can hardly say that he did not replied michael for some notion or other came into his head and after i left him he sent for me to come back again it was however by a friendly messenger who knew well enough who i was and gave me pretty plainly to understand which way i had better walk and that was good luck again but i was sorry too to have to turn away from the old place without learning any news of my former acquaintance i found the same overlooker at sir matthew dowling's mill and that was all i could find out sir matthew dowling's mill at ashley that's my country too my wife keeps a school at milford replied the man and we have heard enough of sir matthew can you tell me anything about his daughter martha demanded michael with the appearance of being greatly interested in the inquiry she was very kind to me and i loved her next best i think to my own dear mother and brother do you happen to know anything about her not just at present replied the man though they do say that all the family are likely to have a downfall owing to sir matthew's getting into a scrape about bad bills or something or other t'other side the water but i do well remember something particular about miss martha that you talk of a matter of seven years ago and if she was good to you it was more than she was to everybody for it was all along of a cruel piece of treachery of hers that i lost the best mistress that ever man had i dare say if you come from ashley you must know the name of miss brotherton though it's long since she left milford i was her coachman and if it had not been for miss martha dowling i believe i might have been so still i was but just turned ten years old at the time i knew miss martha returned michael but i shouldn't have thought she could be treacherous to anybody she was though for all our people knew the whole story from first to last and a queer story it was too when one thinks of the end of it which was neither more nor less than sending our dear young lady away out of the country i never happened to know anything about the lady who owned the park replied michael except that she was one of the fine folks as i have seen at dolling lodge but i should like to hear the story because of miss martha why the short and the long of it was that there was a poor widow called armstrong michael started so violently that his companion stopped did you happen to know her my lad he added after a pause yes sir i remember her very well but please do go on well then this widow armstrong had two sons and one of them was had up to the great house dowling lodge i mean for some nonsensical reason or other and sir matthew pretended to make the greatest fuss in the world about him and the whole country was talking about it but for some offence of the poor boys i never rightly heard what the old sinner determined upon sending him prentice to the most infernal place by all account that the earth has got to be ashamed of and how do you think the poor widow was coaxed over to sign the indentures why by your friend miss martha and no one else and that i know upon the best authority well tis a long story the ins and outs of it and i can't say that i ever rightly understood the whole but this i know to be fact that our young mistress took the whole thing so much to heart that she actually set out to look after the boy but when she got to the murderous place the poor little fellow was dead and what did she do then dear tender-hearted lady but bring back a pretty little girl instead of him because as we all guessed she was determined to save somebody the emotion of michael armstrong on hearing this was so entirely beyond his power to conquer that he lost all capability of utterance and instead of asking the name of the little girl an inquiry which he in vain strove to make he sat pale and gasping with his eyes fixed on the speaker and every limb trembling the lord have mercy on us what is the matter with you my good fellow said miss brotherton's ci-devant coachman you look cruel bad 
is it my tale as turns you so or is it that you have walked too much and too fast no 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 pray go on murmured michael making a strong effort to articulate tis the story then and you knowed the poor armstrongs beyond all doubt said the kind-hearted coachman well then you shall hear the end of it when my mistress brought back the news of the little fellow's death his poor mother who was but a sickly cripply sort of body just broke her heart and died whereupon miss brotherton took home the other boy put him to school to my wife and then took to teaching him herself and treated him for all the world as if he had been her own brother and then she began to fancy that he wanted a doctor and then groaned michael suddenly interrupting him and then he died you don't say so said the coachman in an accent of regret did he indeed poor boy well now i'm sorry for that for it was a pleasure to see him growing taller and stouter every day almost as one may say and when was it he died it's curious that we should never have heard of it heard of it said michael while a sort of wild uncertainty took possession of his mind that gave him the feeling of one whose reason threatened to leave him heard it why did you want to hear it could you not see and know it if he was living in the same house with you for certain i could if he had died while miss brotherton remained at the park but that he did not for i drove him off the first stage myself alive and well and looking as beautiful as he always did poor lad for he was to be sure the handsomest faced boy that ever i looked upon but what might have happened to him afterwards is of course more than i can say for when the place was sold and all of us paid off all we heard was that our dear young lady was set off to travel in foreign countries and had left pensions to every one of her servants according to their length of service so we know nothing since is there no one can tell me where she has gone and in what land my brother died said michael violently agitated your brother said his companion who do you mean by your brother my lad teddy my brother edward i am michael armstrong was the convulsive reply god bless my heart and soul and you be the boy as miss brotherton went to look after and she got it into the wrong box then about your being dead was there ever anything like that but who was it my boy that told you your brother was dead a woman in ashley one living in the house where my mother died she told me that my mother was dead and my brother too did she know who she was speaking to did she know you was michael armstrong said the old coachman with quickness no she knew me not replied michael but she knew that the widow armstrong and her boy were dead and i'll be hanged if i believe as your brother is dead replied the other eagerly when she said the widow's boy she meant you i'll lay my life on it and there is nobody in ashley if they had told of her death but would have named that of her boy too but it would have always been meaning you because everybody knew that one followed close upon the news of the other and i don't believe that your brother's dead and that's a fact michael clasped his hands rigidly together and closing his eyes remained so long motionless that his good-natured companion became alarmed and laying his hand upon the poor lad's arm shook him gently as he said anyhow my good fellow there is no cause for you to break your heart with thinking about it all talking about your poor mother and her love of you as made you turn as pale as a sheet and natural enough too perhaps but my notion that your brother is alive and well ought to comfort you oughtn't it michael opened his eyes and fixing them on his companion said the joy of it is more than i can bear and then the tears bursting forth he wept copiously a timely relief for which he had great reason to be thankful well well i don't mind seeing you cry a little that won't do you no harm and thank goodness your colour is coming back again i declare i thought i had been the death of you said his new friend but i'll tell you something more and that is the name of him as knows more about miss brotherton and your brother too i'll be bold to say than anybody in the whole country and that's parson bell of fairly 
and where is fairly said michael starting up how long shall i be in getting there the hope is only hope yet you know there is no certainty edward dear dear edward is it god's pleasure that i should see him again in this world is it possible that such a heavenly dream can ever come true oh how often have i sat upon the hill and watched the clouds and thought that he was above them all poor boy but twill be better still for a few years to come that he should be upon the earth along with you won't it where is fairly reiterated michael how long shall i be in getting there longer than you'll like my dear boy replied the coachman it's a good sixteen miles from this very house i should not wonder if they was to charge seventeen and you must not think of trying to compass that to-night for you are not in any wise in a fit condition for it changing colour as you do every minute your best course will be to rest here for the night and set off again by times to-morrow morning and that will bring you in easy by about the middle of the day you know impossible said michael i owe you more than i am able to thank you for and i would be willing to show my gratitude by following your advice only sir i am quite sure i could not sleep a wink and i don't think it would do me any good to lie tossing from side to side unknowing for certain whether my own dear teddy was alive or dead so if you please i must set off directly that i may know the best and the worst at once i suppose at your age i should have done the same therefore i won't pretend to quarrel with you for it replied the good man but i suppose it would be just prudent to call for an ink-horn and to set down a bit of paper the name of the good clergyman that you are to call upon as well as his place of residence there is no need of that sir said michael parson bell of fairly are the words you said and they as well as all the rest you have spoken seem as if they were stamped upon my very heart but yet before i start i should like to use the ink-horn too that i might write a line or so to my good master i know he will be troubled in his mind about me if i don't get back and i don't know rightly how long it may be god bless him good man continued michael it was he that had me taught to write and he shan't be left with any doubts or fears upon his mind for want of a letter from me this was a measure that the coachman greatly approved and observing that he was well known in the house and sure to be minded he undertook to order the writing materials as well as something substantial by way of a supper declaring that though he had come into his young friend's wild scheme of walking off straight away for fairly instead of putting up for the night either where they were or at leeds he should not part with him without a quarrel if he refused to accept and do justice to the good cheer he should provide this kindness on the part of the man who had so strongly influenced his destiny was both kindly intentioned and wisely devised for greatly did the agitated young man stand in need of recruited strength and tranquillity before he set off upon a new expedition which was to lead to information so vitally important to his happiness though it was somewhat against his inclination he accepted the friendly invitation gratefully and the materials for writing set before him he addressed the following epistle to mr thornton honoured master your goodness to me in all ways would make any abuse of it on my part a heavy crime indeed too heavy i think for me to commit or you to suspect me of but i cannot be at the supper-table at neckerby on saturday night according to my promise a very strange thing has happened to me dear master which may perhaps come to nothing and in that case i know you will hear my story and pity me too much to think of anger but if all i hope comes to pass your generous heart will rejoice with me and you will bless your own goodness for bringing me to the knowledge of the very greatest joy that ever fell to the lot of a human being by giving me this holiday i am honoured master your faithful and grateful servant michael armstrong having finished his letter and committed it to the post michael felt somewhat more tranquil and endeavoured to assume with his new acquaintance an air of greater composure and self-possession but his heart beat his temples throbbed his thoughts wandered and when he and his friendly companion sat down to supper the poor boy felt that he could almost as easily have swallowed the board itself as any portion of the substantial fare which was spread upon it but he quaffed a long and refreshing draught from a pitcher of cold water and putting at the suggestion of the worthy coachman a crust in his pocket he sallied forth with the agitating consciousness that on the information of which he was in pursuit hung all his earthly hopes 
his new friend shook his head as he felt his feverish hand and marked his heightened colour and his eager eye god bless you boy said the good man remember if you fall sick by the way that my name is richard smithson that i live at milford near ashley and that i'll hold myself ready to come to you at a pinch if you should happen to have need of me and here michael armstrong are three sovereigns that i give you to keep for two reasons one is that you may use them in case you have need the other that if you don't want them i shall be sure to see you when you bring them back and that you will do or i'll never trust a lad's face more and now good-bye it is but a wildish sort of boy's trick though setting off this way at night when you ought to be in bed the air and the walk will do me more good than all the beds in the world replied michael god bless you sir see me you shall if i continue to live and so saying he strode forth into the night with a longing for greater space to breathe in than could be found in the kitchen of the royal oak the boy was right as to the effect which this bodily exertion would produce upon him the very darkness calmed him he took his hat off that the cool air might bathe his temples with its dewy breath and though his pace was rapid and scarcely relaxed for a moment during many miles the action of his pulse became more healthy and the aching of his throbbing temples passed away all he now seemed to fear was that his imagination should cheat him into the persuasion that all he wished was true edward fanny for of her identity with miss brotherton's protege he could hardly doubt when he remembered the history of her departure from the deep valley these names seemed to ring in his ears and to be inscribed in starlight on the heavens as he raised his eyes towards them and thus the sixteen miles were traversed before he had half chewed the cud of all the sweet thoughts that thronged upon his fancy when he reached fairly it was still much too early to find any one stirring so michael unceremoniously walked into a cart-shed and clambering up into a vehicle that had the sweet savour of newly carried hay to recommend it he placed his bundle under his head and despite both hopes and fears fell into a sound sleep nor waked till cocks hens cows pigs and ploughboys all joined in chorus to arouse him End of chapter twenty seven